right, we'll get going now. Uh, welcome to the physics department. Uh, as you may know, the physics department engages in a very wide range of research. There are 45 active faculty here in, in these buildings. And uh, the area that I work in in particular is experimental cosmology. And as you see, you'll see, uh, what we're doing is uh, trying to learn about how the universe started and evolved, uh, but by building experiments that we, uh, we really build with our own hands and uh, that we take out and, and measure things. Now, here is a, a one slide summary of the entire talk. So if someone tonight asks you, hey, what did you see at Cal Day today? If you can remember what's on this slide, you'll remember my entire talk. And uh, that is uh, starting here, that we live in a golden age of cosmology. In, in every physics field, in fact, in, in many endeavors, often there is a, 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 real, uh, a real golden time for progress. And uh, I'll argue that uh, right now, the last really 20 years, we are really learning a huge amount about cosmology. Next uh, here is that in, that in that golden age that we're in, we've start, we're starting to have a detailed model uh, that is emerging of how the universe started and how it's evolved. That model starts with a big bang. We find that the universe is expanding with time, getting bigger and bigger. We expected that, ex uh, that expansion to slow down with time, but we've been surprised by the discovery that that expansion is in fact accelerating. We don't know why it's accelerating, but we've, uh, we are saying that uh, is being driven by something called dark energy that we don't yet understand. We've discovered that most of the matter in the universe can't be seen. It's not in stars and the things that you see out in the sky. And so we've given that a name too, even though we don't understand it. We've called it dark matter. So, so this is a huge amount of progress, but we still have this uh, minor problem that we don't understand about 95% of the stuff in the universe, and that is this dark matter and dark energy. And by 95%, I mean if you weigh how much energy there is in the universe, 95% of it is in this dark matter and dark energy that we don't understand. So let me begin at the very beginning. Now, the universe began uh, with a bang. And what evidence do we have from this? Well, let's go back to 1927, where all uh, cosmologists smoked pipes. And, uh, and we'll uh, hear about the story of Edwin Hubble, who, uh, using this telescope here, the Mount Wilson 100-inch telescope, he started looking at uh, uh, this, uh, this data here, which is he started measuring galaxies, uh, asking how far away are the galaxies, and then asking, well, and how fast are those galaxies going? And we found it very interesting that the further away the galaxy is, the faster the galaxy is going. And that is uh, consistent uh, with an expanding universe. Now, wh why is that? Why do you get that? The further away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving. When I should say that, uh, to talk about how fast we're learning things, it was controversial uh, just before then that there even were galaxies, meaning that you know when you look out in the sky, you see the Milky Way, and you know that. Now you know that that's our galaxy. You know that that's a, we live in a spiral galaxy. The, and you know, and everyone here knows that, you look outside our galaxy and there are other galaxies. But even that was controversial back um, in the early uh, 1900s. So uh, when uh, Edwin Hubble said, hey, you know, not only are there galaxies, but when you look at how uh, the, the ones that are further away are going faster, that was really a, a revolution in, in what we knew. All right, so let me get back to the question. Why should it be that the further away a galaxy is, the faster it's going in the expanding universe? And I've got my, uh, my little toy universe here. And what it is, it's, it's a balloon. And uh, the galaxies are painted on this balloon. You can, you know, if your eyes are good, you can see the galaxies. And, um, and this is a 2D model of our 3D universe. So just the surface. You just think of the surface as a good model for how the universe expands. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to blow it up for you here. Okay, now if you put yourself on any one of the little galaxies on my little balloon here, and, and as the balloon expands, you ask, what's happening to all the other little uh, galaxies on the surface of that balloon? Well, what you'll find is that every single uh, galaxy is running away from you. Okay, this one, from this point of view, every other galaxy is running away. And what you'll find is that the, as the balloon expands, 
the further away the galaxy is, the further away the dot is on the balloon, the faster it's going. Okay. So this happens. This is just, this is just 2D, uh, but it works in three dimensions too. You can think of people like to talk about uh, uh, loaves of bread with raisins in them. Imagine you put a lot of yeast in it, and uh, and as it bakes, it, it gets uh, bigger and bigger. And all the raisins similarly will run away from each other. And the further away the raisins are, the faster they'll be running away from you. Just like just like this plot. Okay. So with this data, the argument was that the universe. Uh, was expanding, which was a uh, which was huge news. And I'll come back to that towards the end of the talk. Okay. <coughs> Next part of the story <coughs> is that uh, these gentlemen, Kensington Wilson, in 1965, they uh, they uh, discovered that if you look anywhere on the sky, the sky is glowing, and it's not glowing in uh, visible light. It's glowing in very long wavelength radio waves. And uh, and uh, and this was this was really surprising that the uh, the everywhere you look on the sky, it apparently has this glow to it. And in fact, if you look more closely at this glow, uh, you'll see that of course the spectrum, meaning the brightness versus frequency, which I'm plotting here, which is brightness versus frequency, you'll find it has a characteristic shape, brightness versus frequency. And this is what's known uh, to physicists as a black body spectrum. Okay, and that, that is, if, so for example, if you took a piece of coal and you heated it up to a few thousand degrees and you measured the spectrum, you would find that it has a spectrum which is just like that. So any, any body that's in thermal equilibrium, uh, that meaning it's at all at one temperature, will have a characteristic spectrum that looks like that. So, so that's, that we know that about a lump of coal, but what's really surprising is that if you look out in the sky, the entire universe seems to have this one temperature. And it turns out it is uh, 2.725 uh, Kelvin. I should say that this is measured with the Tobii satellite, and uh, these error bars have been blown up by a factor of 400. So this is a magnificent experiment where uh, this is the best measured uh, black body that's uh, ever been looked at. Okay. So the so the 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 uh, the really funny thing about this is that if you look on that side of the sky over there, it's 2.7. 2.5 Kelvin. If you look at that part of the sky, it's 2.725 Kelvin. And those two ends of the universe that we're looking, you can look at if you, um, if you look that way and that way, they haven't talked to each other uh, in billions of years. Okay? Yet they're at the same temperature. So, so something's going on there. The, uh, the analogy I like is that it's, it's as if uh, some, a package shows up on your doorstep one day and you open it up, and inside there's a chocolate chip cookie. You say, oh, someone sent me a chocolate chip cookie. And inside the and inside the cookie, someone has uh, put a very precise thermometer, and you find that the cookie temperature is 105.0000 degrees Fahrenheit. You say, huh, that's unusual. But you eat the cookie, you don't think more about it. But you go to your neighbors, and and they say, hey, did you get a cookie? I got a cookie. And and, and you say, yes, yeah, it was a very good cookie. And and they say, uh, and they say, well, the funny thing was 105.000 uh, uh, Fahrenheit. You say, huh, that's unusual. And then so you find uh, that uh, everyone in your city got that cookie, everyone in the country, in fact, everyone in the world got a cookie, just like that. And so you, you, you know, being a, a scientific thinker, you think, huh, you know, maybe those all came, the fact that they're all exactly the same temperature, maybe they all came from one oven, um, uh, very, uh, you know, uh, in one baking session, and they were sent out to everyone at the same time, and we all got our cookie at the exact same temperature. And the universe is exactly that way. The fact that you look anywhere on the sky, and that, uh, and that uh, right now, the, uh, the two ends of the universe have not talked to each other in billions of years means that uh, it likely was that there was one cosmological oven. And that cosmological oven was all at one temperature, and that the ends of the universe you see out there are all the cosmological cookies that are all at the same temperature. Okay. So that is, and that, that is consistent exactly with uh, this idea of a Big Bang, that the universe started out as a small, hot object, and that now we're seeing it as much larger and cooled off, cooled off all the way down to 2.7 Kelvin, but um, all at one temperature. Now, um, let me pause my story. My, my main story today is about that, that radiation, that glow, which is called the cosmicroid background. But let me, uh, let me pause in that story for a second to tell you a very important fact about uh, about the cosmic microwave background radiation, but what happens afterwards? 
And that, that can be given by this uh, cartoon here. That uh, you, this is, I, I always like showing this because this is uh, one page. I can give you the entire history of, of the universe. And as I said, we believe the universe started out in the Big Bang. And uh, during the big, right after the Big Bang, uh, due to quantum mechanics, the universe can't have been completely smooth. Quantum me mechanics tells you that uh, energy levels are discrete. And when you work out the math, it couldn't have been that you had a completely smooth universe. Uh, after, uh, shortly after the Big Bang, we believe an event occurred, which is called inflation, where the entire universe uh, exponentially grew, very rapidly grew. And grew so fast, in fact, it actually grew faster than uh, the speed of light. And uh, then, and that's, and that's, uh, that's OK if the, if the entire fabric of space grows. Then um, about 300,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe is cooling this entire time. And after 300,000 years, the universe is cooled enough that you can form neutral hydrogen atoms. Before that, you couldn't, it was so hot, you couldn't even form, uh, you couldn't even form neutral hydrogen. Even earlier, you couldn't even form the nuclei uh, that make up atoms. They were broken up into quarks. But at this time, 300,000 years, it's cooled enough that you form neutral hydrogen. And the, um, during all this time, there was light bouncing around like a ball in a pinball machine uh, with the um, ionized hydrogen. But when the universe is cooled enough, uh, that hydrogen can form. This light doesn't bounce around anymore, and it's free to uh, stream uh, all the way, in fact, across time to be picked up by telescopes here on Earth. So these, these, uh, these microwave background photons, this light from the very early universe, ha was emitted at 300,000 ap years after the Big Bang. And you have to come all the way forward to about uh, 15, in fact, we now know closer to 14 billion years after the Big Bang, where we received this light in telescopes here on Earth. Okay, so really, because this, uh, this light has come all the way from 300,000 years after the Big Bang, people like to say that that's a, a baby picture of the universe, that we're looking back all the way to uh, uh, the beginning of time, essentially, and we have a picture of what was going on there. And what we see is, as I'll show you more in a little bit, that uh, uh, the time of 300,000 years, uh, the universe was fairly uniform, quite uniform, in fact, but at the level of parts per million, there were fluctuations there. And these, are, these come from the quantum fluctuations even earlier. Now, why are these fluctuations important? Well, the, um, these fluctuations are important because the, those tiny fluctuations, parts per million, uh, they grow via gravity into all the structure that you see when you look out in night sky. When you look out, if you go camping and you, you're in a very dark place, look out in the sky, you see, you see stars. Um, and you see the whole Milky Way structure. If you brought a telescope with you, you look out and you see galaxies. And if your telescope was really good, you would see, uh, you would see uh, clusters of galaxies where galaxies are brought together. And further and further out, you see lots and lots of structure in the universe. And that's what our telescopes are showing us. And this is a little cartoon kind of view where you see, uh, you see the galaxies painted on the sky. And you can see in this little cartoon, there's lots of structure. Well, all that structure grew from these small fluctuations that are shown from the cosmic microwave background, and uh, they're grown via gravity uh, uh, to all the structure that you see today. So this, these tiny fluctuations are, are essential to our model of the universe, because those represent the fluctuations that grow into everything you see out on the night sky. Okay. And now, uh, as I said, I'm going to pause my story to tell you a little bit about how that structure grew. And I'll do that. Uh, here's a, 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 a movie. And it's a computer simulation. What people do is they put, uh, they make a cube, and they put matter in that cube. And that uh, the matter in the cube is very uniform in density. But there are little seed structures in there. And those seed structures are the ones I just talked about in the cosmic microwave background. And when I start this movie, what you'll see is how in the computer simulation structures grow. Okay, the little seeds. Uh, are growing. Gravity pulls uh, objects toward any over density. So any place that's a little bit more dense will, um, will start a, a collapse, a runaway collapse, where all the matter ends up at that slightly more dense place. And I, I really like this movie, so I'm going to show it to you again. Uh, I back up. Again, you see 
just a little seeding of structure grows into uh, all these structures of galaxies on the sky. And these simulations are actually uh, getting better and better. They really are starting to look like what you see out in the sky. Now, I want to show you this other movie. And this is uh, the movie I showed you is quite a uh, large chunk of the universe. This movie is um, a little bit different. It's showing you the local universe. And uh, let's start out with, uh, there's our sun right there. But now uh, you're moving away. And this is, this is real data, but turned into an animation where uh, you, you paint on uh, uh, galaxies where all, the, uh, where all the known galaxies are. And so that's our Milky Way. We, <coughs> as uh, I've seen this animation from far away. But now you're backing away. And now you're starting to see other galaxies. So early on, you saw the stars in our, our Milky Way. But now you're starting to see other galaxies. And this would be uh, as if you were traveling. And uh, you see there are different types. There are spiral galaxies. There are elliptical galaxies. And this, all this data was taken with a, uh, an experiment called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which uh, was in Apache Point, New Mexico, and has been watching this, the sky for years just cataloging all these galaxies. It doesn't measure the entire sky. So what you're going to see is that the structure measured is in sheets. The universe uh, actually isn't in sheets, but this is the way the survey was done. So there are all those galaxies. And now you can start to see these structures. And these structures here are on tens of what are called megaparsecs. Um, and uh, a parsec is uh, uh, fairly close to, uh, to a light year. So now you can see in these sheets, you can see all these, uh, you can see all the structures, and uh, you can see it looks uh, a little bit like uh, like a foamy structure, like foam you'd see uh, uh, on the ocean as you're walking on the beach and, and looking at uh, looking at the spray. Okay, now we're going even further out, and these aren't galaxies. Now these are what are called quasars. These are uh, very bright objects that we believe have black holes at the center of them, and uh, and they're so bright we can see them very far away. And so what they've done is they've painted on the cosmic wave background, showing how far away it is. Because as you go, uh, as you go back in time, you're also going further away, uh, given how light propagates. And so you see uh, the local universe and then the far away universe. So let me get back to my main story, which is in C and D constellations. And uh, I'll show you this cartoon again. I'll keep coming back to this cartoon. Here you see, again, as I said, this baby picture of the universe. And, uh, and so how big, how big are those fluctuations that you see in the map? And the answer is they're very, very small, about 10 parts per million. And so given that the temperature of the universe I told you is about 2.7 Kelvin, we're looking for 20 to 100 micro Kelvin uh, in fluctuations. So how big is that? So an analogy is uh, if you compare those fluctuations to the average temperature, it's like the biggest redwood tree uh, that you see in a park compared to the entire diameter of the Earth. And so when you want to measure this, these tiny fluctuations, you have to keep in mind that that's the scale that we're looking for. And another way, uh, another fact to tell you how hard this is, is if you ask all the power you detect from the cosmic wave background uh, in all the telescopes on the Earth that were looking for it, uh, that couldn't heat one drop of water by one degree. So that's the kind of signal we're looking for out on the sky. So how do you, given that that's so hard, how do you do that? Well, we're going to employ a, a kind of detector called a bolometer. And it's really actually an old technology uh, coming from the 50s. Uh, Langley invented the bolometer, which is really a sort of thermometer. Uh, it can measure the heat of a polar bear seat from a distance of half a kilometer. And let me tell you, this, uh, this, this actually isn't that hard an experiment. Um, as, uh, it, uh, that's, it's, impressive. it's good for a limerick. But, uh, but actually, the amount of, uh, for a bolometer, this modern day bolometer, this would be quite easy. But what's hard is measuring these uh, tiny fluctuations. Now, how does a bolometer work? Well, what you do is you take oh, an absorber for light, and you purposely isolate it from its surroundings. And uh, you cool the surroundings very cold, because what you want to do is you want to reduce what's called thermal noise in the detector. Uh, any, anything at a finite temperature has molecules that are jiggling around uh, due to that temperature. And if you cool it down, those molecules quiet down, and you'll have a much uh, uh, more sensitive detector. Now, here's what bolometers actually look like. 
Uh, here's a picture up in the corner. Uh, this is one millimeter per scale. So this is where the light comes in, is picked up by an antenna, and then sent by one of these, uh, the antenna sends the signal to these barometers over here that, as I said, are isolated. And uh, these antennas are, um, are similar to the kind you'd have in your cell phone, for example, in, in picking up the radiation, but they're much more sensitive than your cell phone. And one of these pixels is in, uh, in this array here, this array of hundreds of detectors. And uh, uh, there's, in total, a thousand of these uh, sensors or these barometers on this, uh, on this array. Now, this array is made from a silicon wafer. It's made by the same kind of technique that you make a chip inside your phone or um, inside your computer, for example, a Pentium chip. And uh, as I'll talk about in a sec, these are made on campus uh, by graduate students here in the department. And uh, this, and so in fact, this is uh, this is one of the uh, very interesting things that PhD students in my group are learning. And then one of these arrays goes into the overall what we call a focal plane. Uh, and you can see the size scale is about as uh, big as my hand, and this is about as big as a really large plate to give you a feeling. Now uh, this is the lab here on campus. We have a new building called the Marvell. Uh, it's actually called the Nano Lab, Marvell Nano Lab, and uh, in fact, I think there's some tours uh, that you can go on for Cal Day if you look at the schedule. And as I said, these are the, this is made using the same kind of technique of optical lithography that you'd make, uh, for example, Pentium chip. Uh, now, an interesting thing is, as I said, uh, the work in my group is done by PhD students. So here's uh, me and, and a few of my students. And uh, for these experiments that are uh, trying to make these very sensitive measurements, uh, we have PhD students making uh, the, the detectors. And one of the things that many people don't know about, uh, about uh, science research is uh, that a, a much of the research, and in fact, the universities, most of the research, are done by people in their 20s. Okay? These, are, these are graduate students in uh, physics departments and other science departments who are doing, uh, who are doing the work. So if you get educated in, in, for example, physics, and you go to graduate school, um, you will be at the forefront of whatever research you'd be doing uh, right away as soon as, you, as, you start, as soon as you start doing that research. And I think that, as I said, it's something that people don't realize. They think that it's uh, perhaps uh, older, uh, middle-aged scientists uh, who are doing the work. But no, it's really people in their 20s who are pushing this, uh, pushing this research. So I'll talk about uh, a few different experiments, which is there, there's been a, a Several different experiments. It's such an exciting field that many people are working on it. An experiment uh, that I worked on is called Maxima. And Maxima was a telescope uh, that you can't see the dish here, but there's a, there's a parabolic reflector here. And then a very sensitive camera that has these galometer type detectors in it. And, uh, and what's going on in this picture is that the telescope is attached to a helium balloon. Okay? Just like a, a kid's helium balloon, except that this one's about five stories tall right now. And as it rises in the sky uh, and, the, and the air gets less dense, it actually gets as large as a football field. Um, and, uh, and in fact, it gets um, it's as large as a football field and uh, floating very slowly in the sky. And I think um, these kind of balloons account for quite a number of UFO sightings. Uh, and if you've, ever, if you've ever seen one of these, um, you, would, you would understand right away. When the sun hits it just right, it looks just like a flying saucer. And in fact, um, if you've ever heard the name uh, of Roswell, New Mexico, I'll let you know that that's very close to a balloon base. And, uh, and um, I think uh, some of the sightings that uh, come from around there are from these balloons. So the balloon has a parachute attached to it. And so after the flight, there's an explosive bolt that gets fired. And then our telescope comes down back to the ground based on that parachute, uh, hopefully safely. <coughs> So uh, during one night, we made a measurement of the sky. Uh, this is about 10 degrees by 10 degrees on the sky, so about that large an angle. And at the time, this was the most sensitive measurement of this size of, of the sky. And so these hot and cold spots that you see here, this is a little hotter, a little colder, um, these hot and cold spots are hot and cold spots from the very beginning of the universe. And um, each hot spot you see there is uh, uh, is a, represents a, a slightly hot spot from the very early universe. And that slightly hot spot is a slightly more dense region 
that's going to start attracting matter toward it and start making things like stars, galaxies, and clusters of galaxies. So here you are seeing an actual baby picture of the universe. Now, the other thing I should tell you is, if I told you this is 10 degrees by 10 degrees, um, so here this is one degree, for example. If you look at this map, um, do, you, do you see that there's one scale that's sort of dominant in the map? You know, if you had to tell someone there's a scale in the map, what would you, what would you say it is? Uh, you know, a, a, a prominent scale. What, what would people say? Half a degree. Okay, very good. Half a degree. Okay, so um, so um, I would agree with that. Half a degree, maybe a degree, something on that scale. So what we do is uh, we uh, we take this map and we analyze its um, its spectrum. And before I get there, let me tell you what we're looking for. Um, what, what we're looking for here is uh, we're looking for what the geometry of space is. And, and Einstein told us many things, um, but one of the things he told us is that space itself can be curved. Uh, and that's a, that's, a, that's a revolutionary idea, that, that the, the actual fabric of space can be curved. And maybe you're familiar with this idea. You've probably seen that, uh, talk, heard people talk about black holes. And the way we think about black holes is you take a rubber sheet and you put a, a, a heavy ball in it, you know the rubber sheet curves. In fact, they have something like that at Lawrence Hall of Science. And, um, and that's the, that represents Einstein's idea of a heavy object curving space. Well, not only is space curved around a black hole, but the entire universe can be curved. And uh, so it, um, it uh, can have a geometry that's flat, or it can have a positive curvature that's represented like this cartoon, or a negative curvature like this cartoon. And uh, we all learned in school that if you take a triangle, um, that you add up the three angles and it adds up to 180 degrees. Well, it turns out that that doesn't have to be the case. That's only true in so-called Euclidean uh, geometry, where, uh, where space is flat. If space is positively curved, you can see here that if you add up these angles, it adds up to more than 180 degrees. So if Einstein's uh, was right and the universe was curved, you might have to go back to school and relearn all your geometry because uh, this would all be changed. And similarly, you have less than 180 degrees here with this curve. So um, with those little, uh, with that measurement I just showed you, we're actually able to tell which of these cases because we actually know uh, how large those spots were way back in the early universe. And what happens is, because of the uh, curvature of space, light travels um, along these kinds of triangles. And if we measure the angle of this triangle, from, uh, from emitted from the early universe, we'll be able to tell which of these cases is true. Okay, so in other words, we have this, uh, what you can call a standard ruler, meaning we know how big those spots were at the beginning of the universe. We measure the angle in the sky uh, of those spots, just as you, you guys did just a second ago. And that represents, the, in the spatial spectrum, um, a peak. And we, uh, and we look at the angle of that, of that peak. Okay, and it looks like this. The, this is the spectrum. So you're used to uh, the spectrum of sound. Higher frequencies are at one end of the spectrum. Lower frequencies are at the low end. Uh, but this is a spectrum of angles. So small angles are over here. Big angles are over here. And about um, half a degree um, is, uh, as was suggested, is about here. Okay? And this is bigger or smaller. So if we could tell how big the spots were in that picture I just showed you, we could tell which of these three stories are true about the universe. And it turns out that, um, uh, that we measured it with exactly that map. And this is the uh, power uh, measured in microkelvin squared. And this is the angular scale in some fancy unit um, uh, called multipoles. But really, as um, uh, this is about half a degree. This is about a tenth of a degree over here. And you can see we made a nice measurement. The line is the theory. And these little dots are experiment measurements with error bars. And um, you, uh, you compare that to theory, and you find it's exactly consistent with that middle picture. So the good news is we're not going to all have to go back to grade school and learn, learn geometry again. I bet you're relieved. You probably didn't even know that was a possibility. Um, and uh, and we, know, we know that the universe has this flat geometry. So it turns out that um, that's one of the first things we learned from that kind of map 
But there's many, many things to learn, and so this has been a subject of great interest among cosmologists. And in fact, before uh, the experiment I worked on called Maxima, there was an experiment called COBE, which is a satellite which is taking data about 1990. And, um, and this is the kind of map it made. And this is, this is a little unfair to COBE because it measured the entire sky. But this is just showing you the, the resolution it had. And you can see that it, it measured this, these temperature fluctuations. But it didn't have enough spatial resolution to measure the spots that I just showed you. So then we measured the spots here in between these two satellites. But then um, in about the year uh, in the in 2000s, uh, this satellite called WMAP was launched. And it was able to measure those spots with more precision than we were able to with Maxima, but confirming what we saw. And then just, um, just a few years ago, the uh, European Space Agency launched something called PLUS that had even better resolution. So you see we're, we're improving as we go along here in our, um, in our measurements. Now, this, um, this, the measurement of COBE, measuring those fluctuations for the very first time, was so important that uh, it, it uh, earned the Nobel Prize. And so I show here one of the two Nobel Prize winners, George Smoot, um, uh, who's a professor here at Berkeley. And here's George in his uh, a very nice tuxedo, uh, holding up the Nobel Prize. This is every physicist's dream to be standing there in Stockholm um, with, uh, in a tuxedo, holding the Nobel Prize. And um, if that isn't enough, not when you win the Nobel Prize, many things happen to you. And, um, and for George, he was able to uh, be on the television show, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? And in fact, he won, and he got a million dollars. So, uh, so that, that's, uh, that was great. And he was actually got to be on this TV show called uh, Big Bang Theory. And so there's George, along with the cast of the TV show Big Bang Theory. So for all the young people in the audience, you see all the good things that happen to you when you know, win a Nobel Prize. So study hard in school. This is a picture of the Planck satellite um, on the ground uh, being built. And so you can see the mirror here. You can see the image of the photographer um, in the mirror. There's another mirror here uh, that's pointed, uh, that bends light back toward the focal plane. And here's the focal plane. So that's like the chip in your camera that's picking up the signal. Uh, and uh, here's the way it looks like when it's taking data. It's just a cartoon, of course. But uh, what it shows is, uh, here it is spinning. And, uh, and that's the way it scans the sky. So here it comes around. You can see the image of the focal plane. First mirror, second mirror that bounces the light like this. And as it spins, um, it's, it's tracing out a map of the sky. Now, what this cartoon's going to show you is uh, a little bit fanciful. It's going to show the experiment painting the fluctuations onto the sky. So of course, uh, it's not actually painting the fluctuations on, it's just measuring them. But it, this is showing you the scan pattern in which it measures the sky and the resulting fluctuations. And so this is, uh, uh, the satellite's still out there. It's nearly done with its mission, but <coughs> here it is uh, measuring uh, this animation the sky. Now you see the fluctuations up here you wonder, well, what's this bright stuff here? That's the galaxy. The galaxy is very bright in these wavelengths that uh, they're looking at. And uh, that's not from the beginning of the universe. That's local. That's the Milky Way. But we can ignore that when we're, do when we're making our cosmological assumptions. And there it is stretched out into uh, a TV map. So, and uh, these measurements are, are, are really uh, groundbreaking. And whenever we make a, a real a step in progress, You'll see it on the front page of uh, newspapers. And here it is, front page of the New York Times. If you look, this is March uh, 2013. So this, this, uh, this just came out weeks ago. So here you are uh, seeing, uh, seeing these uh, very new results. Okay. And again, we can, now we can measure the spectrum. And you remember that the, this is power or temperature versus angular scale. Again, half degree is here. And now you can see uh, that uh, we're measuring a much wider range of scales. And not only do we measure one peak, but we measure many. And if you remember uh, the maximum measurements, our error bars were about this big. Okay? Now the error bars are so small, I can hardly see them on this plot here. And uh, so this is WMAP uh, and uh, SPT, uh, sorry, Planck is uh, uh, the two satellite measurements. Active SPT are two ground-based measurements that can measure out to smaller scales. 
and I worked on the SPT team uh, measuring out uh, these bumps out here. And the, there's a line in here, which is the theory, and you can see that there's just an exquisite match of theory and experiment. Uh, it almost looks like we know what we're doing here, right? That, uh, that you, you can write down on a piece of paper how these fluctuations should look, and you go out and you measure them with a satellite with ground-based experiments, and it's just right on the line. Okay, so, so this is part of what I mean when I talk about the golden age of cosmology. We're really making huge progress in our detailed knowledge. So let me tell you that, okay, so that is up to today, in fact, up to a few weeks ago. But let me tell you about what I'm working on right now, and that's the next stage, which is measuring not the temperature fluctuations, but the polarized fluctuations. So I told you before, if you were able to look out in the sky, and let's say you had eyes that could sense microwaves, um, uh, you would see that the whole sky is glowing. And then if you look, if you look a little more carefully, maybe you'd have to put on your glasses, you see the very faint fluctuations on the sky. And those are those fluctuations I told you about that are the, uh, the seeds of structure. But now, let's say you put on your polarized uh, sunglasses, and you look at the sky, um, and what you have to do is you have to look at the sky, then turn your head, and then look back again, and compare those two pictures, okay? And um, don't get yourself dizzy when you do this experiment, uh, but if you did it really carefully, you would be able to see that there are uh, polarized fluctuations out in the sky. And uh, those polarized fluctuations are the, are the next thing that we're exploring in this research. Now I'm going to go back to my cartoon and tell you that, again, we're going to go back and look at 300,000 years after the Big Bang, but this time we're on the hunt for polarized fluctuations on the sky. And um, why are those interesting? Okay, so let me, uh, let me tell you a little bit uh, about uh, some fundamental physics. Uh, one thing that you may know is that there are only, we believe, four forces in, uh, in all of physics, in all the universe, we believe that there's only four forces. Uh, there is gravity, which you know about because it's holding you to your seat right now. If I were to go back behind the, uh, the bench here and turn this big switch that I have just for lab demos that turns off gravity, you'd all start floating up, up toward the ceiling. Uh, and, uh, but I won't, I won't do that. Uh, and uh, you know um, about electromagnetic forces, that is holding you together. Um, all the atoms in your body are held together by uh, electromagnetic forces. So you better, uh, you better hope that's gonna keep working uh, for the near term at least. Um, but less known is the strong force which holds together the nuclei of atoms. They're holding together all, um, all the nucleons inside the nuclei of the atoms in your body. And finally, the weak force, um, which as the name implies, is a very weak force that mediates um, some, uh, some particular kinds of interactions, um, uh, including the ones that uh, scatter neutrinos. Okay, so, um, so you can observe these four forces, but if you uh, go back in time the universe gets hotter and hotter. Remember I told you that the uh, early universe is hot and dense. And um, hotter is equivalent to meaning higher energy. Okay, if you think of the molecules in your, uh, in your body or in any object, as you get hotter and hotter, the molecules are moving faster and faster. And that means higher and higher energy. And that's, um, so if you go back in time, and you go back to hotter temperatures, you're going back to higher energy densities. And it turns out, if you look at the very early universe, it's so hot that it represents energy scales that are higher than uh, present day high energy particle physics accelerators are exploring. So the CERN accelerator is exploring uh, equivalently, it's a, it's a 14 TeV uh, tera electron volt, but that's equivalent to temperatures around 10 to 15 Kelvin, and that's what um, you need to discover the Higgs particle that's uh, recently been announced um, from CERN. But if you go back to the early universe, we could actually look at energy scales that are um, 10 orders of magnitude or add 10 more zeros to the energy scale of what we can learn back there. So that's really exciting. If we could go back to this early time, we could see that three of the four forces are unified, which are so-called grand unified theory scales. And we might even see a hint from even hotter uh, temperatures where all forces are unified. That's called the Planck scale, where um, the theory that would describe that would be the so-called theory of everything, you know, a very modestly named uh, theory. Okay. And that theory of everything, uh, it could be a string theory. 
uh, that you've all read about. So maybe if we can go back to learning about um, string theory and about how, um, how about how the theory of everything would describe the entire universe. Okay, so now you can see why we're so motivated to measure this. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is it's really even a tinier signal. I talked about micro Kelvin a little while ago. Well, now we're on the hunt for nano Kelvin, hundreds of nano Kelvin. Okay, so we have to advance in our in our technology of uh, of, of detectors, and that's something that my group here at Berkeley works very hard on. Uh, this is an experiment that we're uh, working with right now, called the polar bear experiment, polarization of the background radiation, and it's sitting at 17,000 feet in Chile. Um, and 17,000 feet, you're probably thinking, wow, that's pretty high. And you might be wondering, can people work up at 17,000 feet? Well, the air is half as dense as it is at sea level. Uh, turns out you can work up there, uh, but often we'll wear oxygen tanks on our back that shoots a little bit of oxygen into our, our noses. And um, here's the cast of characters. Really, I just want to show you uh, a picture of uh, the people working on the experiment. And, uh, and uh, for example, Yuji, who's uh, in this picture, is sitting up here in the audience. And as I said, the people who are really doing this research are people in their 20s. Okay? Most of the people in this group are, are young people in their 20s. And, they're, and, and everything you see in our experiment, from the basic detectors, the design of the detectors, um, and these are, these are really revolutionary detectors trying to measure these nano Kelvin signals, to how you, um, how you put those, uh, how you design the optics, to how you scan the sky, how you analyze the data for these very fun, uh, uh, faint fluctuations. That's a very subtle art, and that's uh, one of the things that Yuji is an expert in. And um, so all these things are uh, done by uh, these young people in the group. Okay. So I'll, I'll show you a little whirlwind slide show of, of how we assembled the telescope recently. Here's our construction crew um, in Chile. And uh, so here is uh, where things were in June of 2011. Okay, and uh, so you'll see how fast it got put together. And uh, at first we just had a plowed site. Then uh, we were we put concrete down to put the telescope uh, on. And uh, there is uh, there I am uh, right after the concrete was poured. Uh, and uh, that triangle is where you mount the telescope. Uh, there is the telescope arriving at 7,000 feet uh, lower. And it uh, is in pieces and has to be driven up. And you can see how dry the site is. It's one of the driest deserts in the world in northern Chile. Um, here it is being driven uh, up to the uh, high site. And uh, there's the first piece arriving. And uh, there's one of the graduate students, uh, uh, Dave, who's from San Diego. And uh, now we're putting another piece on there. Uh, this, this part rotates. Uh, this is a big bearing. This is a what, uh, very big lazy Susan, basically. And the whole top of the telescope can turn. Um, this is the part that holds the, one of the mirrors being assembled. This is the secondary mirror being installed. And that's uh, being put, that part being put on the telescope. That's the primary mirror. Uh, this, is, um, this is one of the most expensive parts of the experiment. So I'm, uh, I'm off to the side, I'm, uh, uh, nervously biting my nails, uh, hoping I don't drop it. And uh, luckily, it didn't get dropped. It got installed nicely. And uh, there you see, this is our control room. Uh, and uh, here's, uh, here's uh, one of my graduate students here at Berkeley, uh, Brian. And, uh, and she's starting to look at uh, the data coming in over the telescope. Uh, this is picture taken a little later than the other pictures. And here's the assembly of the camera. Um, I told you that the detectors are cooled to very low temperature, about a quarter of a Kelvin, a quarter of above absolute zero. So in other words, uh, minus 272 degrees. Uh, Celsius, so very cold. And um, uh, here we are assembling the focal plane. These are these barometer detectors I told you about. And uh, uh, this is being assembled at the site. You can see here's one of these oxygen uh, 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 tubes so we can breathe a little bit better. Uh, here is the uh, structure being assembled into the telescope. And here we're wheeling out the camera, about to install it in the telescope. And it's only about eight months later we took our photos to begin with. And uh, here we are, um, uh, less than a year later, ready for what we call first light. All, all these kind of astronomical or astrophysical experiments, when they first start, they see their first photons coming through, it's called first light. All 
a slip of time. And uh, here you see the very first signals we could see. And these aren't, these aren't fluctuations in the cosmic ray background. Just to get going, we look at a planet, just a bright object in the sky. But, um, but here we are on the first day seeing a planet in two of the polarized detectors. And, um, and so that was a, that was a very uh, nice time in the experiment. And um, so now we've been up for a year taking data. And here's a map of the sky. Uh, and it's, um, this is about five degrees by five degrees. And this one is just a temperature map. Uh, and we call it preliminary because we're just making sure that it's done correctly. And we don't have our polarization maps yet. But uh, this map, uh, but there, uh, it, it, uh, it would look roughly similar to this. You can see the polarized fluctuations. Of the sky. And this map is uh, right now the deepest map uh, or the most sensitive map of the cosmic ray background ever done. Okay, this is about, uh, you saw the Planck satellite, this is 10 times more sensitive. Or you would need 100 years of the Planck satellite to see this level of detail. Okay, so um, so there's, uh, and that is, we're getting that rapid progress um, from the development of these detectors, uh, for example. Okay, so that's where we are, and um, so stay tuned for, uh, for looking back at the very early universe with these kinds of measurements, and perhaps seeing these really high energy scales where the forces unify, and we'd be able to see energy scales way beyond uh, accelerators. So that's, that's gonna be, that's gonna be really exciting. Uh, so let me tell you, um, I'm coming to the end here. Uh, let me, the last chapter here is, I wanna talk about the, uh, the dark side of the universe. And that is, uh, that is these things that uh, uh, dark matter and dark energy that we don't understand yet. So, um, so when I, remember I told you that Einstein told us that space can be curved. And when space is curved, if you send light through space that's curved, it'll bend. So uh, go back to that rubber sheet analogy. If you have a black hole that's making a dent in the rubber sheet, as you send light past the black hole, it's just like rolling a marble on that sheet. And I think that's how the uh, Lawrence Hall of Science demo goes. And what you'll find is that if it rolls not too far and not too close, um, it'll, it'll deflect, it'll bend. And that's called gravitational lensing. And it's called lensing because it actually does magnify uh, objects that are behind the black hole or any massive object. And so here, what you see is you're seeing a bunch of galaxies. These are foreground galaxies. But they, um, they, and so they represent what's called a cluster of galaxies, where many galaxies are in one place. But then you see these funny shapes, these arc shapes. And those arc shapes are not arc, you know, they're not banana-shaped galaxies. There's no such thing out there in the universe that we know of. But what it is is that that's gravitational lensing. And what's, that's called strong gravitational lensing. And what Einstein theory tells us is that a galaxy that's being lensed will uh, turn into what's called an Einstein ring. It'll turn into a circle uh, that if the, if, the, um, if the galaxy and the lens aren't perfectly aligned, the ring breaks up into arcs. And so these arcs are uh, gravitational, strong lens and gravitational arcs. And by looking at these arcs, we can weigh how much this gal galaxy cluster weighs. And, um, and uh, what we find is, uh, if we uh, take the number for how much it weighs, and we count up all the stars and galaxies inside the galaxy cluster, we find that we can't account for all the mass inside that galaxy cluster. Uh, in fact, most of the mass is not accounted for by the luminous matter, by the stars inside that galaxy cluster. So, um, so what's going on? Why, why is it that there's so much mass in there that we can't see? Well, um, so we think it's uh, some kind of stuff which we're calling dark matter. And uh, we don't know what it is, but we have to call it something, so we call it dark matter. And, um, and so how are we sure that there really is this stuff called dark matter? You know, for example, couldn't it be that gravity doesn't work the way that we think it works? That's possible. You know, we think that gravity is the so-called one over R squared force, meaning that as you move away from, say, the Earth, the force of gravity weakens by one over the square of the distance. Okay, now maybe it's not one over r squared exactly. Maybe it's a little bit off of that. And so that explains why we can't account for uh, this correctly through this gravitational lensing. Okay, but here's some evidence that that's not true. That there really is some stuff out there that is dark matter. And this is a picture 
of a particular galaxy cluster called the bullet cluster. It's called the bullet because it's just so it's like a bullet. And what's happened is two galaxy clusters have collided. And so you see one cluster here and one cluster here. Now, this, um, the yellowy stuff is the normal stuff, the stars and galaxies. And you can see that they've collided and, and in fact, they've gone past each other. They've, um, uh, this one went through this one and they've gone this far apart. Now, what's this stuff? This stuff is the gravitational lenses. And what's happened is, it's a measurement of gravitational lenses. So this is the dark matter. Um, the dark matter doesn't show up bright like, this, uh, like the stars. It, um, it only shows up in gravitational lenses. So apparently, um, what's happened is the dark matter has moved further. Again, this one came from over here, and this one came from over here. But the dark matter has passed further along than the luminous matter. Now, why is that? It's because the luminous matter um, interacts, um, it interacts very strongly. It, it collides. All those stars collide via gravity um, and other interactions. Uh, electromagnetic interaction, whereas the, uh, the dark matter only interacts via gravity. And so it, it doesn't have the same kind of collision. It's free to move past only being held back by gravity. Okay, so let me show you a simulation of this. This is a computer simulation. But here are two galaxies, uh, sorry, clusters of galaxies. They're minding their own business, flying through space, but all of a sudden, just like uh, two skaters in a skating rink who are in a collision course, they, they find themselves uh, about to hit. And uh, here they are. And so the luminous matter is the brightly colored stuff. And you see it, it starts to hit, it, uh, you see it hitting uh, there. And, but it gets stuck because of all those collisions. But the, um, the dark matter can go past because it doesn't interact in the same way. Uh, and it only interacts with via gravity, and it goes past. And so that really shows that, um, that it isn't just gravity, uh, a lack of knowledge of the way gravity works, that makes us think there's dark matter out there. There really is some stuff out there that appears to act uh, like, uh, like uh, um, act differently than normal matter. Okay. So on all scales means that you see gravity, uh, dark matter, you see it in our galaxy, the Milky Way, you see it in clusters of galaxies. Any length scale you can think of in the universe to measure, you see this dark matter. So what is it? Is it scaled stars, you know, stars that just don't light up? Is it some kind of, is it gas? You know, there's lots of hydrogen gas out there. Or is it some kind of exotic particle, such as a weakly interacting mass, weakly interacting massive particle? Um, we actually know it's not just stars and gas. Because we know from our, our, our theory of the early universe, we know how much normal matter there is, and there isn't enough. And so people are motivated to look for these exotic particles. And in fact, an experiment going on at Berkeley, uh, among, uh, in addition to other institutions, called the Cryogenic Dark Matter Search Experiment, CDMS, is looking for these exotic uh, particles. And here's a detector. It's made from a germanium crystal. This is about as big as my hand. And um, what's supposed to happen is a wimp comes in, and it, uh, it interacts with uh, the germanium, and it leaves some uh, energy there, which we sense on the surface. And just like the bolometers I talked about earlier, this is also cooled to very low temperatures. In fact, even colder than the bolometers from my group. And, um, and it's designed to uh, look for these wind interactions. And so they have to put it, as I said, in a very cold region. They have to be, make it very clean so they don't get a radioactive material in there. And they have to put it deep inside a mine so that cosmic rays don't cause interfering uh, effects. And in fact, there's, a, there's some lab tours of this lab today. So you can look for that on the Calday schedule. Uh, finally, my last thing I'm going to talk about before I conclude is dark energy. And um, here, if you look out on the sky, you can, see, um, you can see stars exploding, what are called supernova events. And, uh, and people had the idea, well, wait a second, you know, these supernova events um, they're so bright, uh, we can see them very far away. Um, perhaps some of these supernovae, um, in particular something called a type 1 supernova, maybe they have uh, very roughly the same brightness no matter where they occur. And if that's true, we can use them as what people call a standard candle, uh, a light source 
um, out there on, in the universe that has uh, a brightness that we know. And, and if we know how bright it is, we can tell how far away it is. Okay? So if we know how far away it is, we can do the same experiment that Hubble did. Um, how far away is something that far compared to how fast it's going? But we can do it on a on, uh, much more distant scale. So we can test the Hubble expansion out to much further distances than Hubble did. Now, here is a, a map of the sky, and you can see lots of stuff there. But if you take two pictures of the sky and subtract them, you'll find, wait a second, something happened, and what happened was a supernova explosion. So that's how you find the supernovae, and you measure the brightness, and you measure, um, that tells you how far away they are, and then you measure um, how fast they're going, and you can do that by their Doppler shift, and you can make a plot like this, okay? Uh, basically, um, in this case, um, how far they are is uh, given um, by one of these axes, and so, so I'm showing brightness here. And as I said, that tells you how far away it is. And then um, the Doppler shift tells you um, the, um, <coughs> the, how fast it's going. And here's the redshift here. And uh, you can then apply models, that's all these lines, for how bright something should have been versus how fast it was going, just like uh, the Hubble diagram I showed before. And if the universe, as we thought a few decades ago, was um, expanding but decelerating its, in its expansion, you would see a curve like this red one. But when people went out to measure this, they found the universe is not decelerating, but as time goes on, it's actually accelerating. So the, it, it should have, theory told us a long time ago, that the universe should be hitting the brakes and slowing down its expansion. But the big surprise is we found that, in fact, the universe uh, uh, is hitting the gas and the expansion is actually accelerating. Okay. okay. And um, so uh, we, uh, this is an observation that we see, but we don't know why it's happening. And again, if you don't understand something, um, you have to at least give it a name. So we're saying that that's being driven by dark energy. But we don't know what that dark energy stuff is. But uh, we know since the universe is accelerating, um, it's, it was such a big discovery that, again, we have another Nobel Prize for a Berkeley uh, professor, and this is Saul Perlmutter getting the Nobel Prize. And I, as I said, um, there are many things that happen to you, perks that you get when you win the Nobel Prize. And uh, Saul's, one of Saul's was that he gets a special parking spot uh, called a Nobel Laureate parking spot. So when you walk on campus, you'll see certain parking spots that have NL on them. And that's a, 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 a the Nobel Laureate parking spot. And as all of you know in Berkeley, having your own parking spot, uh, pretty, a pretty good prize. Okay, so uh, for dark energy, uh, we, ex we expected the expansion to slow down, but big surprise, it, it's appearing to accelerate. And we don't know what's driving it, but we're calling it dark energy. And um, Einstein actually, basically predicted dark energy. In his equations, he had a constant called the cosmological constant that acts exactly dark, like dark energy. And uh, in fact, it's a very interesting historical uh, uh, story that Einstein had this constant in there, but along the way, he decided it wasn't a good idea. And he said, no, nope, I think I should take it out. But he may have been right. It may be that we do need something like a cosmological constant. So it brings me to my next to last slide, which is now to make a pie chart of all the energy density in the universe and all the normal stuff that we know of, atoms making stars and galaxies, they only make about 4% of the universe here. And uh, dark matter makes up about 22%. Uh, so it's much bigger, a factor of about four or five larger than the regular matter. And dark energy is the biggest part of the, of the pie. So you see that everything we learn, uh, we know about in detail is, fits in this little pie wedge. And very embarrassingly, 95% of the universe, we don't know what it is. And so, well, um, I'll say that at least that's, um, that's something for people in the audience, to, for the young people in the audience to uh, uh, become physicists and, uh, and figure out what that 95% of the universe is. Okay, so here's my last slide. It's the same slide that I showed you at the very beginning. Uh, but now you've seen uh, all the details of the story. So indeed, we really do live in a golden age of cosmology. Um, everything, everything I talked about happened in the 20th century. And in fact, uh, most of what I talked about happened in the last 20 years. So we're really, just like the, the, uh, the universe is accelerating in the expansion, 
our knowledge of the universe seems to be accelerated in how fast we're learning it. Uh, we, uh, we have a lot of evidence now that the universe started in a hot dense state, which we're calling the Big Bang. Uh, we, uh, the universe is clearly expanding, and we're, we're learning about the details of that expansion. In fact, we are learning that it's accelerating, but um, uh, it's accelerating for a reason we just don't understand um, by something we're calling dark energy. Also, we see evidence for uh, these, a lot of matter out there. We've been able to weigh how much matter there is, but we don't understand what this stuff is. We're calling it dark matter. And this is what I'm calling here a minor problem, which is that we don't understand 95% of the universe, um, this uh, dark matter and dark energy. As I've said, that's going to leave something for future generations to discover. Thank you very much for coming. Thank <laughs> you.